everybody, welcome back to my channel and welcome back to Halloween. I have a fun and mysterious video planned for you today, which I feel is deserved after the Missy Beavers case. It's Halloween, so we're allowed to blur the lines and step out of our comfort zone to talk about things that you might not normally find on this channel. And hopefully we end up learning something together and we have interesting and stimulating conversations in the comment section because I do find that whenever I research something that I normally wouldn't, it does kind of give my brain an almost electrical jolt, an infusion of fresh and interesting ideas that makes me want to learn more and find out more. So today we're traveling to Denver, Colorado. As a true crime channel, I have noticed, as have many of you, that there seems to be a disproportionate number of big cases coming out of Colorado involving people that are seriously evil and unhinged. Chris Watts, Letitia Stauk, Patrick Frazee, and now we have Suzanne Morphew as well, still missing with apparently no conclusion in sight. And we always say, what is going on in Colorado? Is there something in the water, something in the mountain air, or could there be something going on at the airport? Now, if you're interested in conspiracy theories, this one has it all. The apocalypse, Freemasons, and the Illuminati, the New World Order, and even aliens. Now, to the YouTube employee who I know is going to be manually reviewing this video since I said the word conspiracy, this is not your, your average run-of-the-mill conspiracy video. I'm not putting out disinformation. I'm telling my viewers what kind of conspiracies there are, and most of them I feel like I'm looking at fairly and debunking them if I can. So, you know, try not to look at this as a conspiracy video. It's a video that talks about conspiracies, but it's Halloween and it's just for fun. And also I appreciate all the hard work that all of you at the YouTube team are doing. I understand that reviewing these videos every day is probably tedious and even sometimes traumatic as I do I do hear that you guys see some crazy things and it, it takes a toll. So I wanna thank you for all your hard work. Hopefully you're fair to this video and this channel. And uh, let's move on. Before we get started, let's have a word from our sponsor. And it's a new sponsor, which is always exciting. So I work from home. You all know that by now since you're here watching me sitting in my living room and talking to you. This year, I've probably put on a pair of jeans maybe half a dozen times. And I've wanted to put on a pair of jeans a total of zero times. My main goal always is to be comfortable. So I'm usually dressed like this. Comfort level achieved, certainly, but I look like I just rolled out of bed, which doesn't make me feel my best. I feel my best when I'm comfortable and I look good. Enter Tommy John. Tommy John was created by husband and wife team Tom and Aaron, who worked together to create a line of comfortable undergarments and loungewear for both men and women. They are comfortable enough to wear all day while I'm working, reading, watching movies, or running after the kids, but stylish enough to make my husband notice when I climb into bed with him at night. My favorite part is the fit on Tommy John's clothes are designed for people in motion, so they don't ride up, they don't bunch, they don't twist. When I go to sleep at night, I don't feel like I have to constantly adjust my clothes for comfort. They're almost like a second skin and my husband loves how soft they are. So I definitely get a lot more cuddles throughout the day and at the end of the day, which is absolutely fine by me. As someone who considers herself an expert on comfy clothes, I can tell you the many issues I usually face when purchasing them. They're great on the first wear, but after you wash them or wear them a couple of times, they lose their shape, they pill, the softness goes away. With Tommy John, after several wears and washes, I have encountered none of these issues. They are just as soft, just as comfortable, just as fitting as they were the first time I put them on. And usually, I don't make a habit of discussing my undergarments publicly, but Tommy John has this lightly lined no-wire bra, and this bra is actually magic. As a woman who is a bit top-heavy, I have always struggled with fit issues and uh, let's call it spillage. Um, the girls out there, I think, will understand what I mean. I either have to wear a sports bra that covers everything or I have to wear an underwire bra, which is uncomfortable and I'm always having to, you know, tuck the girls back in. Now I have finally found a bra that's comfortable and uh, kind of sexy, if I do say so myself. So with a lot of us being home more, a lot of us being able to kind of do our work from home, we don't have to dress up, we don't have to wear jeans, we don't have to wear anything that's uncomfortable, but we still do want to look, you know, good and fashionable and it makes us feel better 
about being home all the time if we if we look cute. So for viewers of this channel, Tommy John is offering you 20% off your first purchase. All you have to do is go in the description box, click the link, and use code Stephanie Harlow, which will be shown on the screen so you know how to spell my name in case you didn't before. Now you will. What's even better is not only is Tommy John offering you 20% off your first purchase, but they're also offering you free shipping, which is awesome. I love free shipping. Sometimes I specifically shop at places because they offer free shipping when other places don't. So thank you so much to Tommy John for sponsoring this video. Thank you so much to all of you out there who understand that sponsors are essential to keep this channel going so I can keep bringing you content and let's dive into the video. The Denver International Airport is arguably the most famous airport in the world, and it's also the largest airport by landmass in the United States. When it opened in February of 1995, the airport was unlike anything that anyone had ever seen, and a guide to the airport calls it the world's most advanced air transportation center. With its striking tented roof structures and technological advanced operations. However, it was also very behind schedule and very over budget. Located 25 miles away from downtown Denver and occupying 35,000 acres of land, which is twice the size of Manhattan, and bigger than Chicago O'Hare and Dallas-Fort Worth airports combined, which is strange because the actual airport occupies very little of that land. Most of it is just flat land with nothing on it. But there does always seem to be some sort of construction project happening near the airport, around the airport, which people think is odd. Now, it was scheduled to open on October 29th, 1993 at a final cost of $2 billion. But it seemed that there were many roadblocks that prevented the airport from being constructed on time or on budget. 16 months and another $2.8 billion later, it was finally ready to host travelers from all over the country and all over the world. And to be honest, it is a really cool looking airport. I've never personally flown into Denver International Airport, but now I definitely want to. It was designed by Denver local and renowned architect Curtis Centris. Now, Curtis wanted to create the airport to pay homage to the mountains that can be seen from the airport in the distance. So pulling up to the airport, you're greeted by this really beautiful sort of stacked mountain-like structure. It's just very different and unique as well as visually appealing, which is important because life should be about breathtaking beauty, and I really think that they achieved that with this design. Now it seemed that questions and mystery surrounded this airport right from the start. Many people did not understand why a new airport was needed in the first place, since there is a perfectly good and functioning airport in Denver already, the Stapleton Airport located much closer to Denver. Stapleton International, a pretty nice airport. Well, it's convenient. Everything is it's just right here. Personally, I don't know why they're even closing it. So basically, why are we fixing it if it isn't broken? However, the justifications for building an expensive new airport to replace a perfectly good and functioning airport were given to appease those with questions. The new airport's location was chosen specifically to avoid loud aircraft noise that would be disruptive in industrialized and residential areas. This new location would also accommodate more generous runway layouts, cutting down on wait times in the airport and on the runways. The Denver International Airport Guide says, quote, At a conventional airport like Stapleton International, the pace of inbound and outbound flights is limited, not just by the number of runways, but also wind direction, visibility, and capacities of ramps and concourses. At Stapleton, parallel runways were too close together to allow aircraft to approach simultaneously during bad weather. That and other factors were adding up to 50,000 hours in delays each year. You'd be surprised at how many people, Mr. Mayor, that I've met around the country who have spent the night at Stapleton. Mayor Pena began imagining a new airport, an airport larger than the city itself. Many will continue to argue that it's too far from town, too expensive, too many frills, too big. 
Runways at DIA are arranged in a pinwheel fashion, radiating out from the central terminal slash concourse area, providing a flow through traffic patterns in which aircrafts land, taxi to concourse gates, and take off in one direction. Each runway is situated at least 5,000 feet from any parallel runway, meaning that three arriving aircraft can line up in parallel patterns even during instrument flying conditions." End quote. So this seems to be a very reasonable explanation for the necessity of a new airport. Because as someone who hates flying in general, there's nothing worse than finally arriving at your destination only to sit in the plane for another hour while you wait for your turn to disembark. Allegedly, this more remote location would also give space for future growth and expansion, which can only mean good things for the citizens of Colorado. But what were the reasons given for why the airport went so much over budget and for why it took an additional 16 months over the predicted time of opening to complete? Today, in Tales from Denver International Airport, we are going to start off with a quick explanation of what the New World Order is, since this will be a recurring theme in this video, and not everyone knows what it is or what it's supposed to be. Once again, this is all for fun. I'm not saying this stuff is true. I'm not saying I believe it, but looking at these sorts of things can be interesting and at times kind of terrifying, and it's Halloween or Harloween. So why not? Now, the New World Order is a conspiracy theory that claims there will be a new era of history where a huge power shift occurs. And this power shift is going to change the world forever. This is allegedly being planned by a largely unknown group of elite and powerful people, and their goals are to create a single government for the world, a single religion for the world, as well as a single currency for the world, thus solving all of mankind's problems bringing about world peace, eliminating poverty, disease, and hunger, which sounds really great to me, right? However, this will not necessarily be a peaceful transfer of power, and this group of people working behind the scenes believe that the end justifies the means. They are not above lying, manipulating, and even murdering people to see their utopia realized. There will be a mass depopulation that needs to happen in order to achieve these things, and the methods used to ensure this initial drop in people on the planet will be harsh, and there will be other methods put in place after this to ensure that the world does not become overpopulated again. Those who are allowed to survive will be microchipped and watched for control and tracking purposes. This theme of a new world order, the one world government, and this shadow government that runs the world behind the scenes is constant in many conspiracy theories. And I mean, the way things have been going lately, nothing can surprise me at this point. If someone came to me with legitimate proof and all the receipts that this was happening, I'd just be like, huh, that sucks. Let me prep the bunker. Gotta make sure there's enough coffee down there because I'm never coming out again. Denver International Airport opened its doors to travelers on February 28, 1995, but the year prior, in March of 1994, there had been a dedication ceremony for the airport, and a time capsule was placed at the airport's south entrance, with a large stone over it showing the date of the dedication. But that is not all that's on the stone. From the top to the bottom, it reads, Denver International Airport Dedication Capstone. Underneath that, there is a name of the mayor of Denver at the time, Wellington Webb, and under his name are the names of the governor, Roy Romer, and the secretary of transportation, Federico Pena. Under their names are the words, the time capsule beneath this stone contains messages and memorabilia to the people of Colorado in 2094. And underneath this, it shows the names of two Masonic lodges in Colorado after the words dedication capstone laid by. Then there is this compass engraved on the stone, a compass that is a well-known Freemason symbol. Under that is the date of the dedication, March 19, 1994, and under that are the words New World Airport Commission. So obviously the combination of Freemason symbology placed blatantly on the stone as well as the name of two Colorado lodges and the words the New World Airport Commission. People went nuts trying to figure out what it meant. 
Now, it has been reported that the New World Airport Commission never even existed, and this was proof that the New World Order did in fact exist, and with the help of the Freemasons and the Illuminati, they were the ones responsible for creating and building this airport. In 2003, a man named Greg Erickson, who seems to be affiliated with the Free Press International, wrote an email to the Denver International Airport, and he had several questions. Now, I will talk more about this communication later because I think the passive-aggressive measuring contest on both ends is kind of funny. But one of the questions he asked was, why is there a Freemason symbol on the capstone? And why are the words New World written on the capstone? Now, he eventually received a response from a man named Steve Snyder who worked in the public affairs office at the airport at that time. And Steve Snyder said, quote, the New World Airport Commission was simply a group consisting of local business and political leaders who sponsored and organized a number of pre-opening events at Denver International Airport. The airport was to usher in a new era, making Denver a world-class city, thus the New World name. The group has absolutely no association with the New World Order, end quote. So let's say this New World Airport Commission actually never existed as many conspiracy theories still claim to this day. That would certainly seem suspicious. However, after some digging, I was able to come up with the name of, I think he was the chairman of this commission. His name was Charles Ansbacher. And after typing in his name with the commission's name, I stumbled upon the New World Airport Commission's records from 1986 to 1998. And there's a lot of stuff here. We've got press releases, pamphlets, minutes from commission meetings, and all of these things are currently on file at the Denver Public Library. So it seems that this commission did certainly exist at one point. It was a thing in 1994 when the dedication stone was laid, and it was definitely a thing in 1995 when the airport opened. But after 1998, there are no records that exist. So apparently they disbanded or they just had no need for the commission after the airport opened. Opened, which doesn't mean there is nothing nefarious going on. This commission could have specifically been set up for the creation of Denver International Airport since the 1980s was when Denver began scouting out sites for the new airport. The fact that they chose the name New World Airport Commission certainly still does raise some eyebrows. The Public Affairs Office of the airport claims it was a name chosen with the hopes that the airport would usher in a new era and make Denver a world-class city. But the president of the commission himself, Charles Ansbacher, claimed he had no idea why this name was chosen for the commission, but he thought it might have been a reference to a common symphony known as New World Symphony, composed by a man named Antonin Dovrak. Now, according to NPR, Dovrak wrote this piece of music while he was spending time in the United States during the 1890s. The completed work was supposed to be a mixture of his experiences in this new land, as well as his longing for home, which at that time was in the Austrian Empire near Prague. So I'm not sure why Ansbacher would think the commission was named after this piece of classical music. The official explanation from the airport makes more sense, but it does seem we do not have one solid answer. So we just kind of have to guess as to why it was named that. The involvement of the Freemasons also bothers people, but it does seem that allegedly Wellington Webb, the mayor of Denver at that time, was a Freemason himself. And I mean, Freemasons are kind of known for working with stone, so I guess it's not all that mysterious that they would be responsible for helping create the capstone. Although the Freemasons are technically a secret society, they're pretty much the most well-known secret society in the world. And members don't really try to hide the fact that they belong to a lodge, they just don't really disclose exactly what goes on behind closed doors. However, some people have gone deeper, and they added up the numbers that make up the date of the dedication ceremony, and all those numbers added together add up to the number 33, which they claim is the Freemasonry symbol for the highest degree and perfection. The number 33 also has some scientific and mathematical symbolism. The human spine is made up of 33 individual bones or vertebrae. The word amen has a value of 33 in simple English gematria. The poison arsenic has an atomic number of 33. If we go further, we also find out that Jesus died when he was 33 years old. There's 33 deities in the Vedic or ancient Hinduism religion. The divine name Elohim appears 33 times in the opening chapters of Genesis. 
Now, just to do a little fact checking, at least on the Freemason stuff, I don't believe that 33 is actually the highest degree in Freemasonry. It looks as if there's only three official degrees, with the third being Master Mason. According to the website, fraternalities.com, when anti-Masons talk about the sinister 33 high-level Luciferian Illuminati Freemasons, they are mostly and misguidedly talking about the honorary and last degree of the Scottish Rite branch of Freemasonry. I'm also going to point out, for the sake of spooky fun and nothing else, that the author of this article is a Freemason himself. Located not far from me, actually, in Buffalo, New York. So he could be just trying to throw us off the scent, okay? And just saying that there's no such thing as the 33 degree level, but there there could be. It's also worth mentioning that a good deal of Denver International Airport is named the Great Hall, which is another term used frequently in Freemasonry. Now, there's also a brass plaque located over the time capsule. And this one does give me a little giggle because many people, and when I say many people, I do mean many people, believe that this plaque, which has text written Braille, is actually a secret keypad that can be accessed with a code. Now, what happens after the code is typed in is up for debate. Some believe it will open a secret passageway to a doomsday bunker. Others believe it will trigger the apocalypse. I think it's just the time capsule information written in Braille, but I would love to be a fly on the wall while people stand in front of it and try to like figure out what the secret alien code is that they have to type in to unlock all the secrets. So far, I don't think we have any definitive proof that something mysterious is happening at Denver International Airport, but let's continue on and see if we can't find some. At the time of opening, the Denver International Airport was selling these souvenir guides for $3. And in it, they state, quote, DIA has had some of the most unusual arrivals an airport ever had, end quote. And this refers to the over $7.5 million worth of commissioned art intended for permanent display at the airport. But some of this art raised quite a few eyebrows, specifically the works of an artist named Leo Tanguma, Right when you first enter the airport, on level 5 of the Jeppesen Terminal hang two murals created by Tanguma. The first mural is called Children of the World Dream of Peace, and the second one is called In Peace and Harmony with Nature. So I'm going to place pictures of these murals on the screen while I describe what can be seen in them, then we'll discuss what the theories are, and then we will hear what Leo Tanguma claims he meant to portray with these works. And both of these murals seem to be in two parts, like a before and a after kind of thing. So in the first section of Children of the World Dream of Peace, there's some sort of soldier. He kind of does look like a Nazi soldier. And he's wearing a gas mask with a big ass gun in one hand and a sword in the other. And to me, the sword looks like a scimitar with like this curved blade. To the scary soldier's left, there's some sort of sweeping landscape of women holding lifeless babies and crying. To the right of that, it looks like children of all ages sort of hiding somewhere, maybe underground or in a basement. And they look scared. They look terrified. The soldier with his gas mask on is wreaking havoc. He's standing over what looks like a city on fire. And he is stabbing the white dove of peace with his sword. In the right-hand corner, we can see a piece of paper with words printed on it. And the words say, quote, I was once a little child who longed for other worlds, but I am no more a child, for I have learned fear. I have learned to hate. How tragic, then, is youth which lives with enemies, with gallows ropes. Yet I still believe I only sleep today, that I'll wake up a child once again and start to laugh and play, end quote. Now that is truly sad. This is supposed to have been an actual letter written by 14-year-old Hama Hershenberg, a child who was imprisoned at the Nazi concentration camp Auschwitz and who sadly died there on December 18th, 1943. The mural moves on to a certainly happier scene with a rainbow arching over it and children of all nationalities gathering together to apparently celebrate because it looks like this gas mask soldier guy is dead. He's lying on the ground while two doves sit on the butt of his broken gun. Some of the children can be seen sort of like bending and breaking his sword and the word peace is written in many languages on a yellow banner that threads throughout the picture. 
So I can certainly see how this mural might be shocking to some people at first glance, especially the, the first part. <laughs> I guess it's not what you would expect to see hanging on the wall of an airport. Conspiracy theorists claim that this art holds covert messages foretelling the future. And they argue that the two pieces of the mural have been reversed intentionally to hide the true message, which is that the world has already come together and overcome evil, but then the evil comes back and takes its revenge on the world that try to eradicate it. They point to things such as the gas mask that the soldier is wearing, he's the only one who has it on and all around him people, especially children, are dying. The women holding lifeless babies is allegedly supposed to symbolize a children of man sort of situation where pregnancy and fertility rates are down. And it's becoming harder to have children since many of these theorists also follow the belief that the government has been enacting forced sterilization on its people for years. They believe this portion of the mural could suggest just that. Additionally, the sword the soldier is holding, a scimitar, is a Masonic symbol. The next Leo Tenguma mural is called Peace and Harmony with Nature. Once again, the first part of this mural is kind of uh, depressing, kind of terrifying. Maybe even more so than the first one. So in the background, we can see buildings on fire, a bunch of smoke, like a city in the distance is burning to the ground. In the forefront, we can see some more children and then also some animals. Some of these animals, like this penguin and this bird, are being kept in glass cases. And there's a large leopard in the center, which appears to no longer be alive. The children look very sad, very scared. And in front of them are a bunch of coffins. One holds what appears to be a Native American woman holding a baby. Others hold small children. Moving on to the second part of the mural, everyone is happy. The animals are alive and healthy. There are no more birds burning cities, no more coffins, it's all good now. Upon first glance, I think the environmental themes are pretty clear. One shows climate change, animals dying, going extinct, forest fires maybe. And the second part is more of the world we want, right? Free of pollution where every living thing can be happy and healthy. However, there are some conspiracy theorists who believe this mural paints a picture of why this secret group working behind the scenes wants to exert their control on the population. They view the world as overpopulated, straining its resources resources and they want to fix this problem. So they will just take out as many people as they need to so that the remaining people can have a clean world along with its natural resources. In the first section of the mural, there's a bird featured known as a Quetzal bird. I think that's how you pronounce it. And this bird is apparently sometimes used as a symbol for extinction. Also, in the second portion of this painting, all the children are gathered around this glowing flower, and they say that this is a representation for the new One World government. The government that everyone's going to have to fall in line with when this extinction has happened. And if we go back to the first section, we can see that it looks like a lot of these kids have their own animal in their arms, like each of them has an animal in their arms. And this gives off like a sort of Noah's Ark vibe, you know, like something big is about to go down. So let's get on this Ark two by two and make sure there's enough animals left when the waters recede kind of thing. In general, even people who aren't seeing hidden messages in these paintings were upset by them and kind of wondered what they were doing in the airport. Leo Tenguma, the artist, was confused by the reactions. He claimed he had not intended to upset anyone. He said, quote, The first part of the environmental mural is about the ways that humans destroy nature and themselves through destruction and genocide. The second part is about humanity coming together to rehabilitate nature and revive their own compassion. Children of the world dream of peace is actually an indictment of war. A child dreams of peace while children of the world bring swords to be beaten into plowshares. In Peace with Harmony and Nature focuses on the environment. Humanity, represented by multiracial children, is shocked and saddened at finding our natural world in a trampled and abused state. In the immediate foreground are three concrete coffins, each containing a young girl clutching cultural articles. These three girls symbolize our own humanity as victims of our self-destruction. Notably, through war, slavery, genocide, exploitation, and violence of all kinds, end quote. But there has been some controversy and questions as to whether or not Leo Tenguma was given direction on what to paint, or if he came up with the concept for the murals all on his own. It seems that he grew up in a small town in Texas where Latinos were in the minority and he painted his first mural in fifth grade after three of his cousins were shot and killed by the local sheriff in what has been called a questionable incident. 
And I imagine that this kind of experience was very impactful and traumatic for him as a young child. Now, apparently the teacher was out of the classroom and whenever he had some free time in class, Leo would go up to the blackboard and kind of, you know, draw on it with chalk. He liked drawing lions and tigers, but on this specific day, one of his classmates suggested that he draw somebody killing this sheriff, so that's what Leo did. And then the teacher walked back into the classroom and he got in a little bit of trouble. Looking back on this memory, Leo recalled, quote, Somebody asked me to do that art, and in my life, I always felt that the community needed somebody to express its feelings, end quote. In 1983, Leo moved to Colorado and did a small mural to represent gang violence that was paid for by members of the community. And then in 1993, he was paid $100,000 by the Denver International Airport to create a mural. But as he was painting, he decided to do two instead of one. Leo claimed he was not given any guidelines on what to paint, saying, quote, I tried to paint according to my conscience because I told the committee I try not to paint just for decoration it has to have a meaning end quote so there's this woman and she was a journalist at the time her name was Alex Christopher and we're going to talk more about her a little later in the video but she interviewed Leo Tanguma about his paintings at DIA and at first he told her he had been given guidelines allegedly that's what she said but when she arrived at his studio to ask some follow-up questions on what those guidelines had been he seemed confused, and then he told her, of course there were no guidelines. There's also a man who claims to have spoken to Leo Tenguma about his art. This man's name is Jay Widener, and he's described as a filmmaker and freelance journalist. Widener told Westward.com that he believes the airport is some kind of New World Order cathedral built by those who are moving the pieces around the proverbial chessboard in order to create a one-world government. Widener also said, quote, The artist Leo Tanguma has changed his story. His first story in 1995 was that he was commissioned and told exactly what to paint. Now, in 2007, he says he was the one who decided what to paint. Does it sound like normal operating procedure to just pay an artist to paint whatever he likes in a public airport? An airport that has Masonic influence? Not likely. More likely is they told him exactly what to paint. End quote. Adding more fuel to this fire, within the past few years, it seems as if one or both of Tanguma's murals were removed from the wall with no explanation to the public. When questioned by the Denver Post, the airport claimed they were performing a $650 million renovation in the Jepson Terminal, and many pieces of art were taken down and stored to protect them in anticipation of this. Some people are not buying this story. The airport cost so much to begin with. Why, after only 20 years, would they be pouring more money into a renovation? And in the opinion of the conspiracy community, these pieces of art were not removed to keep them safe. They were removed because the public is deciphering the messages and getting too close to the truth. Because it's not like there's pictures of these murals all over the internet that you can look at to find out the truth. And directly in front of Tanguma's Children of the World Dream of Peace mural, etched into the floor, is a picture of a mining cart with the letters A, U, and A, G inside. Logically, we know that A, U, and A, G are the elemental symbols for gold and silver. And we would assume this etching might be a reference to Colorado's rich mining history, but others see it differently. They suggest that AUAG stands for Australian Antigen, a deadly strain of hepatitis. They also claim that one of the founders of the Denver International Airport discovered this antigen. The fact that this symbol with these letters is directly in front of the mural that suggests the biological warfare causes some to believe this is a message, that the New World Order will be ushered in after a horrible plague is released on the people of the earth and the population has been sufficiently reduced. It is worth noting that the man who discovered the Australian antigen is, uh, his name is Baruch Bloomberg, and this is the same man who invented the hepatitis B vaccine, and his ties to the Denver International Airport are pretty much non-existent as far as I could find. But if any of you out there have some solid proof that connects Bloomberg to the airport, I am open to seeing it. If you were on a plane headed into Denver International Airport, the first thing you would see 
is a massive 32-foot statue of a rearing electric blue stallion with pronounced veins and glowing red eyes. It's not just the conspiracy community that has a problem with this large, demonic-looking horse statue. There was actually a Facebook group created, and the title of this group was DIA's heinous blue Mustang has got to go. But those who are critical of this ginormous blue horse statue claim that it scares their children and even them. Nothing says welcome to Denver like <laughs> staring down the face of a demon horse. But blue supporters <laughs> are horse. How many other cities can brag about having something like that? Here in the Mile High City. It's kind of creepy. We have this guy. A 32-foot... I call it the devil horse. ...known simply as Mustang. As you just heard, many feel this electric blue Mustang is way too demonic. So how did this 9,000-pound electric blue Mustang with glowing red eyes end up on Pena Boulevard? Columbus visitor Kaylee Warren... Extremely strange. ...still doesn't get it. Every time we come here, its eyes glow red. It's really, really creepy. There's a really very tragic story behind Blucifer, leading some to believe he is cursed. The statue's real name is Blue Mustang, but no one ever calls it that. The artist who was commissioned by the Denver International Airport to create this structure was named Luis Jimenez, and he started the project in 1995 after being paid $650,000. Unfortunately, a number of roadblocks caused Blucifer's completion to fall behind. The most notable of these roadblocks happened in 2006. While Jimenez was working on Blucifer, a section of the 9,000-pound horse fell off and hit him, severing an artery in his leg and causing his death. His son completed the statue after the death of his father, and it was finally placed next to Peña Boulevard 13 years after Jimenez began his work and two years after his untimely death. What does seem strange is, Luis Jimenez was a well-known artist who had crafted large sculptures like Blucifer many times before, including this one called Vaquario, which stands outside the Smithsonian. He'd never had an incident before. He'd never made such a dangerous misstep before. So what was different about Blucifer that led to its creator's death? I personally don't believe the statue is cursed, and if we look a little deeper, we gain some insight as to why Luis Jimenez may have made a careless mistake or may have been a little bit more careless in his creation of Lucifer than he had been in the past. As I said, he'd been commissioned to do the piece in 1993, and it was supposed to be ready for installation by the time the airport opened two years later, but Jimenez missed deadline after deadline, causing Mayor Webb to ask at a city council meeting, where is the Mustang? At the time of his death in 2006, 65-year-old Luis Jimenez was facing ongoing health issues as well as a looming lawsuit from the city because they were obviously annoyed that he had not finished the statue yet and they were trying to um, take back a portion of the money and they were basically putting a lot of pressure on him to get it finished. So it does make sense that he may have been in a rush. He may have been in such a rush that he wasn't as careful, and this eventually led to his demise. However, I can agree that the horse certainly does look demonic. And the question of why the artist chose to use LED lights to make Blucifer's eyes glow red? That's always been a lingering question. Conspiracy theories state that Blucifer is a symbol of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. They say he doesn't look like a very nice horse. He looks angry and vindictive, especially with those red eyes. Now, Luis Jimenez was asked this before he died. Why did you make Lucifer's eyes red? And he claimed that the horse's eyes were a homage to his father, a man who had operated a neon sign business and had apparently refused to talk to Luis after he decided to become an artist instead of an architect. This still does make people wonder why he chose red instead of like blue or white or another color, but that was just, I guess, his artistic choice. And he, he does seem to kind of like these red and blue colors. The statue in general does make sense if compared to Jimenez's other works. He did seem to have favored bright colors in his statues, as well as themes that represented the wild spirit of the American West, but Blucifer is not the only statue at DIA that makes travelers look twice and wonder, is there some other meaning or message than what meets the eye? In 2010, the airport welcomed another massive piece to its collection, a 26-foot-tall statue of Anubis, the Egyptian god of death and the underworld. 
as someone who's afraid of flying and can lean towards the superstitious, I have to feel that the last thing you want to see when arriving at an airport to hop on a plane would be the god of the underworld towering over you. Allegedly, Anubis was just a temporary structure put there to advertise for the King Tut exhibit showing at the Denver Art Museum. But of course, many people don't believe this story. And if you head into the airport to baggage claim, you'll be greeted by the strangest sight. Notre Denver consists of two brass cast gargoyles sitting inside open suitcases, presiding over the east and west baggage claim areas. So we've got some devil dyed horse, the statue of a god who will bring you to the underworld after death, a couple of gargoyles who have found their homes in suitcases for some reasons, murals with crying children, murals with cities burning to the ground, murals with dying children, murals that seem to indicate the end of the world or some apocalyptic scenario. Maybe if just one of these things existed in the airport, it wouldn't have raised so many eyebrows. It wouldn't have caused so many questions. But viewed as a collection, the art chosen by the airport does have a sort of morbid and dark feel to it. Personally, me, I just think it's interesting and cool. But I'm into that stuff. I'm into all things dark and creepy, and I also think that art should be celebrated in all its forms, even if it is a little odd, even if it is a little strange. Because, I mean, we're talking about it, right? It got us thinking. It got us talking. Isn't that what art's supposed to do? As long as it's not dangerous to anyone, as long as it's not hurting anyone, art should pretty much, you know, be be left alone, which does kind of rule out Lucifer because he is responsible for the death of his creator, kind of like Frankenstein. Lucifer has already killed once. Will he strike again? <laughs> So when I first heard about the allegations of what the Denver International Airport runways are supposedly shaped like, I went and looked up a picture and I have to admit, I saw it. But then I wondered, am I seeing it because I already know what I'm supposed to be seeing? Like I already know what it looks like, so am I seeing it because it's planted in my head that I should be seeing this? So I took to Twitter and I posted a picture with no explanation asking everyone, what do you see? I also sent a picture to my daughter Nev asking her the same question. and to my friend John, who's also a true crime YouTuber, asking him the same question. JD, what's the case today, master? Oh no, we're not working on a case. Well, I don't think we're working on a case. Um, Stephanie Harlow sent us something. Master, did she Um, send any clues or ways I can help from the shot? No, she didn't give any clues or context. She simply says, look at this photo and report back what do you see. So, let's do it. You first. Well, all I see is a factory master. Of course, that's what you see. You're a robot. Oh, I'm sorry, an AI assistant. Well, without any clues, without any context, without any, I don't even know what video you're working on, so I can't wait to see what you got up your sleeve, little Miss Harlow. I see some kind of a swastika, some kind of a Nazi symbol hidden in some building, you know, doing some kind of secret, I don't know. Um, but that's the first thing coming to my mind when I see these little rails go off to the side. So I don't know what you're up to, but that's what I see. Don't listen to him. See you later. On Twitter, I would say 85% of the responses came back saying that the runways looked like a picture of a swastika. And that's exactly the response I got from both Nev and John as well. So I decided to pursue the theory further. Many people believe that the runways of the airport were purposely constructed to resemble a swastika, which of course ties into the future and fascist reign of the New World Order. Those who follow these theories believe that the powers that be placed imagery all around us, all around you know, the Denver International Airport, all around us in the world, messages of what is to come, and it's up to us to decipher them. This runway is no different, according to these theorists. Similar to crop circles and corn mazes whose full messages can only be viewed from above, the runway is a message to those in the know. You have found the right place. You have arrived. But where have they arrived? That will be explained in our next section, but first I would like to clarify that the Denver International Airport has vehemently denied that this was the intended shape for the runway design. They say it was created in a pinwheel shape. 
and that layout was chosen purposely to make taking off and landing easier and quicker. A spokesperson from the airport said, quote, DIA's six runways do not cross and can be used simultaneously in any weather condition, end quote. It seems Although the airport is ready and willing to embrace and have fun with most of the conspiracy theories that swirl around it, this is the one theory that they are not open to entertaining and they shut it down right away. However, those who believe the runways were purposely created to resemble this Nazi symbol feel it is one of the most obvious and important signs that Denver International Airport is a New World Order hub, and in order to understand why they feel this way, we need to go underground. In 2003, like I said earlier, a man named Greg Erickson, affiliated with the Free Press International website, sent a letter to the Denver International Airport asking several questions. One of them being, are there any underground facilities at or around DIA? Although Steve Snyder had previously responded to him about, you know, the murals and about uh, whether or not the New World Order was affiliated with the airport, Steve Snyder never answered the question of whether or not there were underground facilities. In fact, it does appear that there is an underground city of sorts beneath the busy airport. DIA's official statement for the use of this over 1 million square feet of space is that it houses a state-of-the-art baggage system which would transport passengers' bags from the planes to baggage claim using 90,000 feet of track. This system was used when the airport first opened, but allegedly it never worked the way it was intended to and has since been abandoned and unused since 2008. This is really, it's, it's really cool and I can absolutely see how somebody would think this could be a bunker because it looks it's very stable it looks very protected. sturdy which is good it's an airport right so it's not as spooky as people think um but we encourage people to keep believing right here we go this is a little austin powers but we'll make it <laughs> these are our tunnels they're not full of conspiracy they're full of baggage a spokesperson from the airport claims that it ended up costing too much to maintain and it just wasn't feasible to keep running long term. Currently, this underground space at the airport holds tunnels with trains that run between concourses. And up to 1,000 employees work in this underground area every day, driving luggage around in place of the state-of-the-art baggage system that is no longer used. Seems normal enough, right? However, there are many people who believe something more nefarious is at foot. Apparently, some construction workers who were employed to build the airport claimed it was so behind schedule because there was five multi-story buildings constructed. But apparently there was something wrong with these buildings, and instead of, you know, destroying them or taking them apart to reuse the material, the airport told the construction workers to just bury these buildings underground. Additionally, at the time of construction, there was allegedly this 300-foot high pile of dirt that the airport was calling a landfill. Now, the addition of dirt and garbage and stuff to this pile was supposed to be an ongoing and gradual process, but it was completed in four weeks without any explanation. Now, the delay in the airport's completion has also been attributed to constantly changing construction plans and the termination of contracts of certain teams of workers after they would finish their assigned section. So similar to the tactics of H.H. H. Holmes used during the construction of his murder hotel, this would ensure that no one person or one team would know the exact layout of the airport. They wouldn't know the final blueprint or what the completed airport would look like. The theory is that there's more underground than what the public has seen, and there are a lot of theories as to what the space was actually intended for. Everything from FEMA camps to refugee camps to prisoners for detractors of the government. But the most popular theory is that this is an underground hideaway for the government and the world elites in the event of an apocalypse. In 1994, journalist Alex Christopher, who we already briefly talked about, and her friend, a whistleblower named Phil Schneider, gained access to the airport before it opened after befriending and obtaining information from construction workers who were kind of already looking for someone to spill the tea to. So before we continue on, in the interest of trying to give you all the information, let's talk a bit about Alex Christopher and Phil Schneider. Alex Christopher is a female journalist who wrote the book Pandora's Box, which is essentially a book um, where she puts forth her theories about the New World Order and kind of where they come from. And 
it's it's quite interesting. I would check it out if you're interested in this kind of stuff. Phil Schneider grew up with a father who was a captain in the United States Navy, and Phil claims that his father was a part of nuclear projects and testing. He also claimed that his father was a part of the Philadelphia experiment in 1943, and as a quick Cliff Notes version for those of you who don't follow this kind of stuff, the Philadelphia experiment was carried out by the Navy, and they reportedly were able to use some sort of technology to cloak an entire ship, like make an entire ship invisible. The ship was called the USS Eldridge, and apparently they were successful in, you know, cloaking this entire ship so that it would appear invisible to enemy forces. Phil Schneider claimed that he himself had worked as a government structural engineer whose main job was building secret underground military bases and structures. Before he died, Phil told a story that one day while he was working at one of these underground bases in Dolce, New Mexico, close to the Colorado border, he witnessed an alien-human battle. According to those who believe such things, Area 51 ain't got nothing on Dolce, New Mexico. They say that under this small town, so small it doesn't even have a stoplight, there lies a massive seven-story compound where humans work side-by-side side with aliens. But on this day, someone must have taken someone else's lunch out of the break room refrigerator because the aliens thought the humans were attacking them. So they fought back and a huge subterranean battle took place, leaving 60 people dead. Now, if you're interested in learning more about Phil and this War of the World situation in New Mexico, there's apparently a documentary on YouTube that I'll link in the description box if I can find it. I just wanted to give you guys a quick idea of who these people were, what they believe, and what, what their life's work was, kind of. So while Alex and Phil were underground at the Denver International Airport, they allegedly took some pictures. And Alex sort of wrote about what she saw, and she claimed, quote, Most of the areas are not being used. Dead baggage equipment, long highways, many chain-link fences and locked-up fences that lead to lower levels and to what I know not. Many large open areas are not being used. Many large fenced-in areas are not being used, end quote. Alex also said that as they walked through, Phil, with his vast experience of underground secret bases, pointed many things out to her, such as the fact that the lowest level they were allowed into was warm, not cool, like a basement would be, and that could only be due to the fact that there were many levels below that he was rising from. One of the men who worked construction on the airport told Alex that there were in fact five secret underground buildings with a depth of between 75 and 120 feet. And these structures were connected to each other by three mile long tunnels. Phil and Alex believed that these areas would be used for multiple purposes. The areas that they saw that weren't being used, so basically they were empty. There was nothing going on there. There wasn't activity going on there. There wasn't any equipment or anything. They were just these large fenced in areas. And they thought that they would be used for work camps and prisons due to the fact that the tops of the fences according to Phil and Alex, angled inwards, not outwards. So it seemed as if the intention of these fences was to keep someone or something inside, not to keep somebody out. There would also be areas where people would live and work, areas for medical research labs, food storage, and so on. Alex claimed that in the world, there are people working behind the scenes, pulling the strings of business, politics, and commerce, and she focuses a lot on the British royal family, especially the queen who allegedly has bought up quite a bit of land around the Denver International Airport using a proxy so that it wouldn't be tracked to her. Now there's a lot to this theory. In my opinion, it is the meat and potatoes of the whole Denver International Airport conspiracy and it has been investigated by many people, including one time Minnesota Mayor Jesse Ventura, who hosted a show called Conspiracy Theory for a while. So the main idea is that underneath the airport, in all of these secret buildings and rooms, there are doomsday bunkers that are prepared for the end times. But these safe havens would not be for you or I. If you've ever seen the season of American Horror Story called Apocalypse, you kind of already have an idea of what people will be guaranteed underground hideaways when fire starts falling from the sky. The rich, the powerful, and the politically connected. The select few who feel that it is important for them to remain alive so when the dust settles, they can emerge and take over the world. Unlike many of these other theories we've talked about so far, this one isn't too difficult to believe since we do know facilities like this indeed exist. Take Mount Weather in Virginia, for instance, located in the Blue Ridge Mountains, just 64 miles west of Washington, D.C., 
This is a secure government facility that was used during the Reagan administration to ensure continuity of government in the case of a major world event. I'm not sure that we as the public were even supposed to know this place existed, but in 1974, TW-8 Flight 514 crashed into Mount Weather, bringing it to the public's attention. So there's this guy, and his name is Jim Wink. He's a retired secret agent, and he went public with the fact that he ran these doomsday drills at Mount Weather with Donald Rumsfeld, who at that time was Reagan's chief of staff, and Dick Cheney, who at that time was a member of Congress, as well as many other top-ranking government officials, these drills would investigate how long it would take to get these people out of their homes or offices into a helicopter and to Mount Weather. And then they would be secluded there for sometimes as long as six days under direct orders to not tell anyone where they were going, not even their wives, because no one was supposed to know such a place existed. Mount Weather is 300 feet underground, and it's a massive complex complete with 20 multi-story buildings, enormous water reserves, a sewage treatment plant, a hospital, and a broadcast studio so that the government can communicate with us peons getting torn apart by nuclear zombies above ground. And they even have a crematorium, because, hey, you never know. There's another one of these facilities in Pennsylvania called Raven Rock, and this is basically just this large city chilling inside of a hollowed-out mountain with its own police and fire departments, medical facilities, and a dining hall. Author Garrett Graff wrote a book about this specific facility, and it's called Raven Rock, the U.S. government's secret plan to save itself while the rest of us die. It's a catchy title. Uh, this book is the, uh, effectively the history of the real life designated survivor programs. The Kiefer Sutherland uh, ABC drama that is on right now. And it's a subject that I came to actually in, uh, in 2011. I, as David had said, I have covered national security and politics in Washington for uh, most of my journalism career and had bumped up against these programs multiple times. I talked to people who had been evacuated on September 11th to some of these uh, mountain bunkers around Washington. I talked to people who had been part of these plans during the Obama and Bush years. Uh, and I had even gotten to fly at one point with the first helicopter squadron at Andrews Air Force Base in uh, uh, just south of Washington here that practices above uh, Washington on a daily basis to evacuate officials in the event of some sort of catastrophic event here in Washington. So, But for the 70 years uh, that we have had since the end of the Cold War, these plans, these continuity of government plans were some of the most highly classified, most secret plans of the US government. And even people working in adjacent offices wouldn't necessarily know who was part of the plans and who wasn't. Uh, when Aaron Sorkin, the director, uh, uh, was doing the research for what ultimately became the West Wing and the American president, he was meeting with George Stephanopoulos. This was the 1990s. Stephanopoulos was the White House communications director. And Stephanopoulos showed him uh, uh, what Aaron Sorkin thought was a bus pass in his wallet, but was actually his evacuation pass, uh, sort of his get out of nuclear war free card. And uh, Sorkin incorporates that into a West Wing episode, which some of you might remember, where Josh Lyman, the deputy chief of staff, gets one of these passes from the National Security Council and sort of walks around for the day with this tremendous amount of guilt. Well, Dee Dee Myers, who had been Stephanopoulos's White House press secretary, pulls Aaron Sorkin aside. She was on the set that day at the beginning of the episode and says, you know, Aaron, I think that this is all kind of a hokey premise because these cards don't actually exist. And Aaron Sorkin is sitting there and he's like, wait, you never realized that you weren't going to be protected in the event of a nuclear war and that the person in, literally in the office next to you was going to be? He claims that this place is meant specifically for high-ranking government officials like the president, vice president, cabinet leaders, members of Congress and the Supreme Court, as well as top aides and White House staff. As I was reading about this, I just I had to smile because can you imagine Donald Trump and Nancy Pelosi stuck together for months on end in an underground bunker? <laughs> they would probably need that crematorium. Am I right?
And then we have Cheyenne Mountain, located in Colorado, which is known as America's Fortress and is widely considered to be the most secure facility in the world. Cheyenne Mountain, one mile inside the granite, 2,000 feet down from the top, it is a giant command and control center that has kept America safe for 50 years. Inside the mountain are 15 two- and three-story buildings. They are freestanding but connected by hallways and ramps. There is also a service area to keep the complex running and even reservoirs, yes, underground lakes. You get inside by driving through a two-mile tunnel and when you get to the middle, you see the doors. The two famous blast doors that have kept the facility safe when they're closed. The door to this building weighs 25 tons and runs on hydraulics. It's usually open all the time, but if it is closed, oh, then there's a problem. I mean, obviously Cheyenne Mountain was built to survive and endure through a nuclear uh, event. and. All of us hope that never happens. It consists of 15 buildings, 12 of which are three-story buildings. The other three are uh, two-story buildings. And the whole place is secured by fences, round-the-clock security, and two 23-ton blast doors. So the theory goes that underneath the Denver International Airport, there's the bunkers and everything, and then there's tunnels with a rail system built all the way to Cheyenne Mountain Base, 120 miles away. Now let's look at this from all angles. Let's keep an open mind. We know logically that the government would have plans to stay operational during any sort of dangerous situation. We know they have underground and mountain hideaways, like we have discussed all over the country, prepared for something bad happening in the world. When Denver International Airport was being built, it went way over the time allotted as well as the budget. And construction crews excavated an insane amount of dirt and rock from the earth, 110 million cubic yards to be exact, a third of what was excavated during the building of the Panama Canal. Why was so much of the earth dug up? And given Denver's location a mile over sea level, would there be a more perfect place to create some sort of underground bunker or train system? You wouldn't have to worry about digging through bedrock or hitting water or any facility being built underground flooding. We know there's an underground space located beneath the airport. We don't really know how much of the underground area there is that's developed. And from what we do know of what is actually under the airport, it doesn't warrant the amount of earth moved during construction. And why would they bury those five buildings instead of just breaking them down to reuse the expensive materials? Looking at the airport itself, we can tell it's large and modern, certainly expensive, but really nothing that would justify the almost $5 billion price tag. It's almost as if they used the original budget to build an airport and the remainder of the money to build something else. And these underground areas were initially justified to house this advanced baggage claim system, which never worked correctly and eventually was just abandoned. It's hard to believe they would put so much time, money, and energy into creating this advanced system, only to walk away from it and never attempt to fix it or improve it or streamline it. It's almost as if the baggage claim system was the excuse, the front for why this underground area was needed in the first place. In February of 2007, 14 planes mysteriously and spontaneously developed cracked windshields all at the same time. Some of these planes were taking off, some were landing, and some were just sitting in the airfield. But no one knew exactly how this had happened, and they still do not. At that time, the weather at the airport was a mixture of rapid temperature changes, high winds, and snow. And some airport officials felt the damage to the glass could have been caused by blowing ice or debris, which is terrifying if you think about it, that it would be that easy for some flying ice to crack the windshield of a plane. Like, could that happen while you're flying in the air? Hi. There was also a theory that it could have been a power surge, which affected the electronic system that heats the windshields of the planes, causing them to crack simultaneously. But then why did this only happen to 14 planes and not all of the planes at the airport? In the end, it was concluded that the damage was caused by a mixture of fine particle debris and high winds, but it was never revealed what the debris was or where it came from. Now, around the same time, there were reports at the airport of strong electronic and magnetic vibrations that were causing some people to feel ill and others to develop massive headaches. Conspiracy theories suggest that this was caused by either an accidental explosion of some kind under the airport, you know, in the secret bunkers, or secret testing being done under the airport. And this is what caused the damage to the planes. There's also talk that Denver has been chosen due to its central location and high elevation and secretive rocky terrain to be the new world order capital of the United States. 
And there are also whispers that the CIA and Langley plan to relocate its domestic division to Denver. This would be a division that's responsible for operational procedures in the United States. Now remember, Alex Christopher and Phil Schneider, who ventured into the underground areas of Denver International Airport in 1994 before it was open to the public. Less than two years later, in January of 1996, Phil Schneider was found strangled to death in his apartment, and his death was officially ruled a suicide. His ex-wife Cynthia wrote a letter, and I will read you some passages from it now. My name is Cynthia Dreyer. I live in Portland, Oregon, and I am the ex-wife of Philip Schneider. Philip and I met in 1986, were married in Carson City, Nevada, and had a daughter, Marie, in 1987. We were divorced in 1990 and lived in separate residences. Philip lived in an apartment complex in Wilsonville, Oregon. On January 17, 1996, I received a call that Philip was dead in his apartment and apparently had died up to a week before his body was discovered. At the time of the removal of his body, his cause of death was by a stroke. When I went to the funeral home, I had feelings of discomfort about his death. I asked to view the body, but due to decomposition, the funeral director suggested otherwise. I wanted to be sure in my own mind that Philip had not died under unnatural causes. For the last two years of his life, Philip had been on the lecture tour throughout the United States, talking out about government cover-ups. You name it, he was talking about it. Aliens, treaties and abductions, UFOs, the one world government, black budgets, underground mountain bases, CIA involvement in civilian murders and drugs, stealth technology, the Philadelphia experiment, Operation Crossroads, Bikini Island A-bomb experiments, missing children, the opening of concentration camps and martial law slash UN involvement man-made viruses and earthquakes, etc., etc. A day later, I received a call from the Clackamas County detectives that the funeral director had found something around Philip's neck. An autopsy was performed at the Multanma County Medical Examiner's Office in Portland, Oregon, by Dr. Gunson, and she determined that Philip had committed suicide by wrapping a rubber catheter hose three times around his neck and half knotting it in front. There are several reasons why I believe that Philip did not commit suicide but was murdered. One, there was no suicide note. Two, Philip always told his friends and relatives that if he ever committed suicide, you would know that he had been murdered. Three, from a number of sources, including his taped lectures, video and audio, and statements to his friends, and the borrowing of a 9mm gun, Philip felt that he and his family were being threatened and were in danger because of his lectures. Four, all of his lecture materials, alien medals, higher math books, photographs of UFOs coming out of the operational crossroad A-bomb, notes for his book on the alien agenda, were missing. Everything else in the apartment was still there, including gold coins, wallet with hundreds of dollars, jewelry, mineral specimens, etc. 5. No coroner ever came out to his apartment after his body was found against Oregon law, and a police investigation never took under consideration that items were missing from his apartment. It was considered a suicide, plain and simple. 6. The medical examiner took blood and urine samples at the autopsy but refused to analyze them, saying that the county would not waste their money on a suicide. Although I was assured that the samples would be kept for 12 months, when I asked for these samples to be sent to an independent lab 11 months later, they were missing and presumed destroyed. 7. Philip had missing fingers on his left hand and limited motion in his shoulders. I believe that it was physically impossible for Philip to have held the rubber hose in his left hand with missing fingers and then wrapped the hose three times with shoulders that had limited motion. In order to end up where his body was, he had to sit on the edge of his bed, wrap the hose around his neck, slowly and painfully strangle to death and fall headfirst into a wheelchair. So there are many people who believe in the conspiracy community that Phil Schneider was murdered. Not only because he knew too much, but because he had said too much and he had no plans on stopping anytime soon. On September 27, 2011, President Obama traveled to Denver right as the comet Elenin was passing by the Earth, narrowly missing us by 22 miles. It was said that if the comet had made impact with the Earth, it would have been catastrophic. It would have caused earthquakes and tsunamis. It would have led to power outages, food shortages, and just generally chaos. Some believe the president was in Denver to ensure that he was close enough to quickly slip underground to safety using the Denver International Airport's secret bunkers and trains to reach Cheyenne Mountain. 
And think about it. If you're going to have a safe place like this, one that's intended only for the important people in the world and you want it to be secret, Mount Cheyenne is not a secret. And they have strict orders that if anyone attempts to break down the doors and go in, they are to stop them at all costs, whatever it takes. So that means if there's some like crazy thing that happens and we know that Mount Cheyenne is like safe and can withstand like a nuclear blast and you know all of these things, if we go there to try to get in, they could shoot us. If a world-altering event was about to happen, such as a comet hitting the Earth or, you know, a deadly pathogen being released, the government isn't going to really tell everyone that it's about to happen because that would cause droves of people to flock to these places like Cheyenne Mountain and Raven Rock, and there is power in numbers. Desperate people would know it was their only chance to survive. And they would try to get in and get their families to safety no matter what. If there was something underneath the Denver International Airport that's affiliated with the government or the military, they most likely would never admit to it. And what better place to hide such a thing than under an airport where you can quietly fly your top officials and rich donors in, hiding in plain sight, so to speak, amongst all the other planes going in and out. No one's going to ask, hey, why are all these planes and helicopters suddenly flying into this area and landing? What's going on? That's strange. Because it's an airport. That's what happens at airports. Definitely food for thought, if you ask me. Now, the people over at Denver International Airport used to push back against these conspiracies, as you can see from this email correspondence from Steve Snyder, who was with the media relations department of Denver International Airport when he was talking to Greg Erickson, the man with all the questions. Steve Snyder said, quote, These questions have been asked ad nauseum by groups like yours throughout the nine-year history of this airport, and quite frankly, they are not our highest priority right now. All of this information has been discussed publicly over and over during the years, and you can select whatever explanation you choose to believe. However, these explanations rarely satisfy people who love to believe in conspiracy theories and who are convinced the Denver International Airport is at the center of something sinister. It is important to keep in mind that this airport was the largest and most scrutinized public works project in American history. There were cameras and reporters documenting every single inch of the dirt ever moved. If something strange was going on out there, hundreds of media outlets would have been all over it by now. I'm surprised it took you nine years to send this email. But since the time of Steve Snyder, the airport seems to have embraced and celebrated its mysterious reputation, which I think is really cool and smart, kind of, you know, a, if you can't beat them, join them attitude. For the airport's 24th birthday in 2019, they installed this talking gargoyle in the Great Hall. And this gargoyle would talk to people about all sorts of things, including conspiracy theories and the Illuminati. That's a little too close for comfort, lady. Oh, oh damn. Um... What, you never seen a talking gargoyle before? Welcome to Illuminati headquarters. I mean, Denver International Airport. Oh, it's because of the conspiracy. Oh, it's because of the conspiracy. Look at me, I'm a little know-it-all. Will you get back over here? I got a question about this conspiracy. Did you have to buy an extra seat for your hat, sir? An employee of the airport thinks that the whole conspiracy theory thing is awesome and he says people walk up to him all the time and ask him, you know, are there really secret underground tunnels beneath the airport? Former airport spokesperson Heath Montgomery told the Denver Post in 2016, quote, We decided a few years ago that rather than fight all of this and try to convince everybody there's nothing really going on, let's have some fun with it, end quote. They actually now have this whole website called The Den Files, a play on The X Files. And the first thing you see when you go there is Lucifer and all his demonic majesty shooting red lasers out of his eyes over the words, you may or may not have heard, Den's got some secrets. Since the airport's opening in 1995, there have been endless rumors and theories. People say our underground tunnels lead to secret meeting facilities for the world's elite. Our blue horse is thought to be cursed. Some believe we are connected to the new world order and the free Freemasons. Some people even say that we are home to a colony of lizard people. And then there's these posters around the airport and they say things like, are we creating the world's greatest airport or preparing for the end of the world? And then there's this other one. It's probably my favorite where it says, coming soon, a secret portal to the underworld. Streamlined security, another misunderstood mural. I love it. I love it. I love that they've done this. I think it shows a really open-minded, fun sort of view. The ability to make fun of yourself is really tough. Um, hard for some people to do, hard for some people to achieve. But I think the whole blending of the conspiracy into the actual business of the airport is a genius marketing technique. And it's just really fun. 
But now I pass it off to you. What do you think about all of this? Have you ever been to the Denver International Airport? Did you send something spooky? Did you try to unlock the secret alien keypad for entry into the Illuminati headquarters? As I have stated before, this video was just for fun. I am in no way saying I believe all of this, but I might believe some of it. Thank you so much for joining me for this video. It was a lot of fun to research, a lot of fun to talk to you guys about. I'm sure it's going to be a lot of fun to edit because I've got some really great footage to kind of splice in. Once again, thanks so much to our sponsor of this video, Tommy John. Check out the link in the description box and use code Stephanie Harlow. And thank you to my Patreons who are always there for me, always uh, are able to give me some really good perspective on my videos before they go live. And once again, I do want to say, because oh, I'm still getting so many comments all the time, why is this video just posted? Posting today and I'm seeing comments from two days ago, Patreons do get early access to the videos and that is why you will see comments that have posted previous to it, to the video posting because they, they do get to see it first. So that's why that's happening. But thank you so much to my Patreons and thank you to all of you who keep coming back week after week to watch these videos and to share in this fun and spooky Halloween season with me. I really, really, really appreciate it. I really do. Trust me. I really do. I'm not kidding. I love you guys. I appreciate you guys. Stay kind, stay beautiful, and stay spooky. And I will see you very, very soon. So you got to let it go